I think it was early March was our first drop, and that was, um, gosh, I can't even remember what was on that first shipment. It, it, it feels like ages ago. Everything has changed now that Superflux is in Alberta. It really does feel like absolute ages, but yeah, apparently it's been two months, so well done me again. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm really hitting all the heads tonight. Oh, man, I, it has been a day. Um, so Strathcona is brand new, uh, and again, I'd heard a little bit about Superflux before, uh, I'd probably heard more about Strathcona even in Superflux, maybe just because they're a little older. Um, I think this is the first time I've seen Strathcona here, but maybe this isn't the first shipment. Uh, we have had Strathcona. It is newer to the market as well. Uh, not quite as new as Superflux. Uh, so we've been bringing in Strathcona since mid-December. Okay. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, when Strathcona opened, they used to do a lot more European-inspired beers. Uh, and then kind of over time they decided oh no wait wow people really like these like the hoppy beers the sour beers uh and that's really exciting actually they have these beautiful beautiful labels on them um and uh a lot of what they do is you know there are a couple things that are our core recipes that they, they they brew and they keep it the same but then there are a lot of beers that they do that they really just like to change it every time it comes out and so we'll see that um with uh, like their love buzz uh which is a, a fruited berliner vice that was or, the one I really uh, wanted to have for this week and was already gone. <laughs> so, it, and the it, thing it was, was, it was in and out. The, the hilarious thing is it was still showing at Connect as I repeatedly ordered it and got out of stock on it as it was showing as in stock. It's like, God damn it, Connect update your damn website. <laughs> um, so we are on now the beautiful Mosaic Pale Ale is our second beer here, yeah. folks. Um, I do immediately kind of jump back to your earlier thought of them doing more European styles. Whereas I think this had, you know, it had some malt to it, but it was predominantly a hop showcase. For this one, the hops are there, but so is the cereal grain. Like the cereal grain is so up front, very crackery, very bready. Well, so this one, uh, it's, it's a little bit more, I, I don't want to say old school, but it's a little bit more West Coast than you would typically get with the, with the hazy beers these days. Certainly uh, clearer. So we are seeing it's, it's Pilsner malt and uh, a little bit of caramel malt in there as well. So that's where you are getting some of those uh, deeper uh, cereal grain flavors is from that caramel malt. Uh, you typically see little to none of that in a lot of these uh, hazy beers. And so uh, beside Mosaic, as is listed on it, uh, we do also see uh, Amarillo and Simcoe in this. And is this a core beer for Strathcona? Yeah, this is a core beer. Both these, the uh, Big Sexy and the Beautiful, are both, uh, both full-time beers for them. Nice. So where does Strathcona come from? I mean, nobody just kind of, well, there are some breweries that kind of come bombing out of the nowhere. They're just this renegade home brewer that no one's ever heard of before that just sets up shop. But most people kind of have a, a provenance of where they came from before. Where does Strathcona and Superfox come from originally? Where do their breweries kind of cut, their brewers cut their teeth? Well, we'll start on the, uh, we'll, again, just kind of work this. So we'll talk about Superflux first, and then we'll talk about uh, Strathcona. As far as uh, Superflux is concerned, it's been a project that's been in the works for, for a very, very long time, as I as I've touched upon. Uh, the owner of, uh, one of the owners of Superflux, um, he actually has worked just about every other job in, in the beer chain trying to set up the brewery. Like, I wanted to make sure that I know, like, every aspect of this and... Uh, so he actually, sorry, one of the owners, Adam Henderson is the uh, one of the owners there. Uh, he actually cut his teeth originally on Belgian beer. Like that was his first true love was Belgian beer. Uh, he used to give uh, talks to, to brewers about Belgian beer and this, that, the other. Um, he actually, if full disclosure, is also one of the owners of Copper and Theory, uh, our dis uh, importing agency. Uh, so when Copper and Theory opened 11 years ago now, I think it is, um, we were importing Belgian beer. We were working with Cantillon and uh, we were working with um, uh, like all these other uh, Belgian breweries because that's just what Adam wanted to drink. And so I don't know how exactly he went from the Belgian beers over to hazy IPAs, but I think it's a lot of business savvy of realizing like, you know what, I love Belgian beers, but I can just buy like Tilcan on the shelf. There's a lot of that, but isn't this there? actually makes money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, we, we sell a lot of Tilcan. Well, no, we don't. We sell some Tilcan. We sell a lot more of this sort of thing. It's it's an amazing beer, uh, the, the Goose Tilcan and uh, Cantillon and uh, all, the, all the rest of these Belgian breweries. But uh, they have been, uh, I don't want to say overlooked, but um, they're a little bit less in vogue than they used to be, which is unfortunate. I'm also a big sucker for a Belgian Saison. 
I am too. And yeah, Craig, you are you are definitely just uh, treading on dangerous ground here. He's whining about how there isn't enough malt backbone. And you know, if you want to say there's not enough malt <laughs> backbone in the Superflex, fine. But if if you're saying it about the the beautiful, you're just flatly wrong. So go back to your garage full of greasy Volvo parts and leave the beer drinking to the experts. Uh, how lovely it is to be able to say those kinds of things to, uh, to people. I generally have my have to be in a position where I'm more diplomatic with my answers to people. Like, oh, I'm tasting like this this like they'll say weird tasting notes like mm, I'm tasting like um, this is a really bitter sour beer. No, no. Oh, that's an interesting tasting note. Yeah. No. Um, Craig gets pretty good treatment. He's he'll be fine. <laughs> Actually, Craig co-hosted like our very first Pilsner one, and he, it was amazing. He like did all the research for Pilsner, and he actually did way more research than I did. So he actually had better tasting notes for most of the things we did than I did. So that's why we haven't had him back, is he was making me look bad. So <laughs> he has to he has to continue to do it. He can just be a researcher behind the scenes. He so said you can like you know if we roll the credits at the end, then he's shown as the, the research assistant. But then you get all the, the uh, credit for being the face of the show. Exactly, which is basically everything Aaron does. <laughs> so, he also forgets to press play on the YouTube page. So if you could maybe oh, did you maybe forget eight, to press eight, play eight, on the YouTube eight, page? Eight minutes <laughs> went by, and uh, so if you could maybe just like issue a bit of an uh, apology uh, to our valued YouTube contingency. I don't know. I think it'd be much more meaningful if you issued the apology. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, anyone uh, watching on YouTube, I'm sorry. I forgot to press the stream button for that YouTube, uh, for the YouTube stream. Uh, oh, yeah, beer. Just one. Just one. We're making a nice they one. They just have to play catch up on themselves for the easy tagger. Exactly. They'll, they'll probably be fine. Um, yeah, where, where do we choose a winner between these two? I'm going to who? I'm just slightly going to come down on the Superflux because it's so immediately likable. I really like the beautiful, but if I'm if I'm picking one just for me, it's going to be the Superflux just because it's so immediately hedonistically wonderful. Like it just it just ticks all the boxes for me. There, I definitely find more going on in the beautiful. It is perhaps technically a better beer. And again, I'm always going off of my oh well. Hazy's dead. Long live the West Coast IPAs. No, just give me the hazy one. I, that, that's just me. I'm, I am completely unafraid to be a massive hypocrite on this one. I, uh, I'll be I'll be honest on this one. I know exactly why I feel this way, but I do have a favor between the two, and all it comes down to is that I don't have a good relationship with the Simcoe hops. Oh. Uh, anytime, I, that's exactly what it is, is that uh, Simcoe, to me, on my palate, just gets very interpreted very much as like a, it's usually an earthy kind of aspect that you get from it. I very much get almost like a verging on garlic note from it. Interesting. I can it's, see it's that. It's unfortunate because there are a lot of really great Simcoe beers out there. I get a real dustiness. You get dustiness? Yes. Yeah, I can <clears> see that being like dusty, earthy. I don't say I get like something like the, the really pleasant bitterness you get from like spinach almost to a oh, point. Yeah. There's a little bit of a vegetal note that I'm really grooving on. I scrape it off your teeth. Yeah, it's got a little of that. <laughs> And Lorraine and Barry have immediately split one, two, and two, one, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> ratings, at ha ratings at the halfway point is we're only 16 minutes in. Awesome. We're killing it tonight. <laughs> we're cruising on these. This is, uh, this we is are a good place cruising. to be. Yeah. Just drinking these delicious beers. What's wrong? Exactly. Like, this is exactly how I wanted to cap off my Wednesday. This is turn my whole day around. <laughs> it's almost like my back doesn't hurt. Uh, so... Um, we're actually going to do the uh, the next two in inverse order. We're going to stick with Strathcona. We'll do the big sexy funk, and then we'll go into the happiness. It sounds like um, this is all just to uh, make sure that we're kind of increasing in intensity for the beers as we go on. Uh, so we go from like the hoppy wheat to the more West Coast pale ale, and then we're going from the hazy uh, hazy IPA to the West Coast IPA. I mean, a little bit of East Coast and West Coast interpretation from both, which I like. Mm hmm. It's, uh, it's fun when they kind of blur the line there a little bit. Yeah, I get the garlic a little too now that he's mentioned that. Yeah, now that you've said it, it's all I can taste. Oh, no, I'm so sorry, everybody. I, that's usually just me. I don't mean to try to put this tasting note into your minds. I think we're way past that now. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, lemon drops for days. Mm -hmm. So this guy is a uh, hazy IPA, perhaps as is evident just from looking at it. Uh, I would never have Azaka. guessed. <laughs> this is Azaka Citrus Simcoe. Uh, so uh, we should be getting a lot more tropical fruit, a lot more, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of stone fruit on this bad boy. And then hopefully rounding off a little bit of earthiness. Now, I'm very familiar with Azaka and Simcoe, or sorry, with uh, Citra and Simcoe. Um, Azaka is one that shows up in a lot of beers and in a lot of beers that I really like, but I don't think I've ever had like a hundred percent Azaka IPA. I've never really had like anyone walk me through it. What is it as a hop? Like what's its kind of key tasting note with Azaka? So with Azaka, uh, the reason you haven't seen hundred percent Azaka really is that it doesn't typically play well with other, sorry, sorry. It doesn't play well by itself. Uh, it, usually you would use it as a more aromatic hop rather than a bittering hop. Uh, so it does need others for structure. Uh, if you were to kind of do a single hop of Zaka, you know, it could work and you get all these bright, very, very tropical stone fruit notes, uh, but you wouldn't necessarily kind of see the, the full bouquet or the structure that it needs, the bitterness that it needs. I think it's the cohumulone is too high in order to support it by itself. It's uh, been much too long since I've actually independently studied uh, uh, Zaka. Fair enough. Now, Simcoe, I'm usually thinking like pure grapefruit and then, yes, yeah, some earthy, spicy things kind of in the background because it's at least tangentially related to like Cascade Centennial. Uh, and then Citra is just, um, you know, just all bright, fresh tangerine and uh, that sort of thing right off the top. Um, yeah, Azaka is one I don't really know. So it's, it's nice to actually <laughs> kind of touch on it a bit. I mean, yeah, as I said, lots of uh, lots of tropical fruit. Uh, we should be getting uh, uh, some mango from it and uh, some other of those uh, 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 real juicy fruits to it. Yeah, I'll say mango for sure. Like fresh mango is absolutely there. I want to, I kind of dig down in the glass to really get that mango flesh character, but it is definitely there. And something kind of like lemon lime, key lime lemon, it's, it's a very pretty citrus note that I don't, I'm assuming that's coming off the Simcoe more than the Azaka, but that could also be coming off the Citra. <laughs> I, I can pick up what you mean. I, I'm, I'm interpreting it more on that lime side of the things, lime side of the scale, perhaps a, a, you know, like a key lime maybe. Or... Craig's picking up something kind of peaty earthy on this. I mean, uh, yeah, we could be. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, ahead, maybe that's say coming it. off the. <laughs> All you. I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> All right. We could be picking it up uh, just again, that earthy note from uh, rounding off with the uh, Simcoe. Uh, this one isn't nearly as strong in the balance for Simcoe as the previous beer was. Uh, so hopefully it's just like sliding in there at the very finish and uh, uh, just helping to support the structure of the beer. You know, it's funny, this really reminds me more of the Superflux than it does the Beautiful. Like, this seems much more of a... <laughs> I, I know they're both hazy IPA, so obviously there's a, there's a style that way, but like, almost more in brewing philosophy, this reminds me more of the Superflux. Like, it's... This, maybe it was just what you put in my head with the idea of they were a European brewery that started making hoppy beers, and this kind of tasted like that to me. Mm -hmm. This tastes more like, we've been making IPAs for five years, this is just our new seasonal IPA, enjoy life um right yeah this this felt more like someone kind of dipping their toe into pale ales and doing very well with it this feels like someone who's very experienced with it i'm wondering did they come out at a different time uh, i'm not sure what the release timeline looks like on that uh, what i might credit that to would be the use of caramel malts in the uh in the beautiful again because that is a very european uh European idea to do is using those caramel malts or even kind of like an older school uh, pale ale along the lines of um, uh, the uh, uh, Sierra Nevada pale is very much like it's pretty much uh, uh, just hops and caramel malts. And a beer I still really like. Oh, it's great. Like if I was, if I was going to get a beer, fun. if I was going to get a beer in the U.S. to just go on like a, a fishing trip or something, mm -hmm. you could do so much worse than Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada pale ale. It's just a beautiful beer. Big time. Uh, I've always been a sucker for uh, the Breakside Pilsner. Oh, yeah. I wish I could yep. sell it. It doesn't sell well enough for us to keep it in stock anymore. 
Actually, you know what? Pilsner sales are doing so much better. That's, I think, in four packs now again, so. Oh yeah, the game has uh, completely changed from, uh, from what it used to be. Well, we used to sell so much flagship and so much Wanderlust, and you know, we'd sell a little bit of what Rough Beast, and then the Pilsner kind of trickled mm -hmm. out. Uh, and then there was that that weird pina colada themed strong beer that I really didn't like, but people kept buying, and I didn't understand by Breakside. Are, are you thinking of? I think you're thinking of from Gigantic. No, it wasn't a Gigantic. Because it was actually uh, so we used to bring in both Breakside and Gigantic. Uh, and kind of on the tail end of when we were supporting Gigantic, who's another brewery that if you've never had anybody listening, you need to go to the Gigantic Tasting Room. It is phenomenal. Um, but uh, yeah, it was actually a collaboration with Superflux because uh, Adam Henderson from Superflux and Ben Love from Gigantic are very close friends. They did a pina colada IPA. This wasn't a pina colada. Lactose. This was called like Beachcomber or something, and it was like a... Rum, oh, coconut. Beach it was based off, yeah, it was coconut and it was based off a cocktail. Yeah, and I yeah, really I hated that. it, but everybody else really liked it and kept buying it, and I just didn't get it. Fair enough. I, it's been a while on that one, but I think I remember it being very wacky, but just loving it so much. Yeah, I think I just, I missed the party on that. It was, whoever it was for, it was not for me. Well, that's like, uh, recently Two Crows did that, uh, uh, that cock the Negroni. They did the Negroni beer. Yeah, uh, and I really wanted to love it and kind of didn't. <laughs> it was so polarizing. I like it. Just the 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 botanical that they had in it, the the herbs that they had in it. It was so bitter in a different way on the palate from what you would get from hops. It was it was an experience. I will agree entirely with that. I'm also coming off completely like a <laughs> stick in the mud about experimental beers, which. I'm totally okay with because that's kind of my brand, so that's fine. I'm, I'm fine right. with just being an angry curmudgeon that hates anything new. That's that's completely fine with me. <laughs> Darn kids, why can't they just brew ESBs anymore? Yeah, god damn it, and not the ones that taste like <laughs> asparagus for no reason, like every American ESB ever. Gotta hate that vegetal note that you off every American ESB. It's just... I don't know what it is, but it seems like all these brewmasters really want to do an ESB, and then they have no idea how, and they all end up tasting like yes. asparagus in the worst way possible. That's really weird. When's, uh, when's the last time they picked up the uh, Hoyn ESB? Oh, it's been ages. I've also proven it's, that uh, I can't really sell ESB, at least in the summer. It's okay. a little bit in winter, but it doesn't do well in the summer. We uh, just had a fresh shipment of uh, the ESB. This is a bit of a shameless plug for, uh, uh, for Hoyn. Uh, we just had more Appleton's ESB land. I think they call it Appleton's British Finest now or something else other than ESB. But uh, the sad part here is actually that, uh, so Frank Appleton is the namesake of the beer, and uh, he was the mentor for Sean Hoyne through the 80s uh, and like really taught him. He was a formative aspect of the Canadian brewing scene uh, for a long period of time. And actually this past week he passed away. Oh no, yep. that's really yep. sad. So, uh, so uh, pour out a uh, pour out a Hoynes Appleton's ESB for. Uh... Pour it out. Yeah, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that kind of puts a downer on things. Um... It, well, it should be a celebration, you know. This guy lived his life for for building the uh, building the Canadian brewing scene. So why don't we celebrate him by reaping the rewards of what has come as a result of him? And yeah, I mean, really, the Canadian brewing scene. I mean, well, Alberta since 2015 is a completely different animal. Canada since I hear in say 2004, 2005 is just absolute. It's not even comparable. You really can't make a comparison to where we were in 2004 to now. There's just no words. Absolutely. I think the number of breweries that we've tasted over doing a year of these, because they're our friends, um, but even notwithstanding those, I think I can count on one hand the number of breweries we've tasted from Canada that are before 2008. Like, it really is just, there is there wasn't anything, which is quite shocking to me, just how young this industry is. Well, I mean, for a very long time, I'm, I'm sure that this discussion has been had several times, uh, but before 2013, Alberta was outright hostile towards uh, small breweries. 
Oh yeah, you just couldn't set one up. It was outlawed, which is staggering to me. It's well, it's not staggering because you know for a fact Molson Labatt just straight bought that legislation. But you know, oh, yeah, and and Big Rock. Don't discount Big Rock's uh, role in the in the in the tri in the trifecta there, or in the protectionism. You know, let's maybe just push back on that just a little bit. I'm I'm curious. I mean. I think of Big Rock as being these like pioneers in the 80s and then, you know, I started drinking them in 2000, 2001 and like they still did seasonals every quarter. They were still kind of cool. Maybe this is a too big a topic, too big a question for just like a Wednesday night, kind of <laughs> completely unprompted. But what happened? I, I know. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, I, I mean, I think what happened there is that they wanted to make more money. Uh, I, I just received a note that's saying the live broadcast has ended, question mark? No, don't worry just about a tech. it. Yeah. Okay. Apparently it's just a tech bug. Aaron's been quietly swearing over here, so I knew something was up, but he, he's not panicking and, you know, tearing his hair out, so everything, everything seems to be broadly fine. Just got to rock through it, man. Yeah, so I think that the thing happened is that they were used to making a certain amount of money and a certain volume of beer, and uh, it's it's hard to get out of that rut of, of making such a large volume and uh, and continuing to be profitable. And uh, how do you how do you stay as low to the ground and maneuverable when you have so many moving pieces in uh, in your in your chain? The other one that I heard was when the Calgary Molson Brewery closed. Big Rock basically brought in a huge amount of those people into their own brewery, and then it became very much they kind of stepped in and said, well, if you want to do this, you want to make money, you have to change everything. And that's kind of when they launched Cold and AGD and all of that was uh, this kind of new brainchild, new staff. But I think you're right. I think it was also just the, how do we keep making money at this volume uh, with, you know, all of a sudden it's not just us and Alley Cat and Molson Labatt's anymore. All of a sudden we're one of a hundred breweries in Alberta how do we maintain market share? And I think they maybe just lost the plot a little tiny bit. And uh, let's let's also, I'm just gonna say here, I'm not gonna tell anybody to not drink Big Rock. I'm not advocating that for anybody. Drink whatever you wanna drink. I've made choices, but uh, I'm not gonna preach to anybody else to do something different. Um, what I will say, I recently heard, uh, maybe you can back this up, is that actually they're bringing back an old seasonal that I used to drink when I, back when I was on the retail side of the equation. And that's the, the purple gas. Oh, wow, I yeah. remember when that came out. I yeah. swear I still have a pap handle around here somewhere. I, I recently heard that it was coming back in this year's uh, summer mixer pack. That's that's kind of exciting. That's a that's a cool little beer for them to do. I will reserve my excitement for the end. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, I'd be really okay if they brought back the uh, the Maybach or um, they call it something else. The It's called Springbok, I think, the first couple times they made it. And it was... You know, we wouldn't call it hoppy now, but it definitely had a hot bitterness, it had a little bit of hot floralness. It was nice and sweet. It was, for somebody who was like 18, 19, when that beer kind of launched, it was really my introduction to craft beer. And I can remember I just started working here and the Big Rock rep at the time came in. Aaron just really swore loudly. So I assume something great just happened on the tech side. Um, so, uh, yeah. Apparently we're missing all kinds of big rock gossip, so this is going well. Um, we might not even be live right now. I have no we're idea. Good. We're, we're good, apparently. Oh yeah. Oh good. Uh, but uh, I was gonna say, like, one of the very first like beer purchases I made that was like getting me into the beer side is when they announced it was gonna be, you know, gone from the market for the summer for the winter. I like bought like six flats of it and drank it all winter, which is how I learned that <laughs> hoppy beers do not last well in an unlike you know chilled garage over the course of the winter. Um, not so much. They were they were not drinking well come April. Yeah, we have uh, we have a hard time with. Uh, I mean, these guys, the Superflux and the Strathcona, anything with this amount of hops. As soon as we start getting onto like you know two and a half months, we're like okay, it's all sold out, right? There's no more kicking around. Yeah, I'm sure you have a terrible problem with two and a half month old Superflux just cooling <laughs> its heels at Connect, just still sitting there like, man, I sure hope somebody buys this Superflux. Hasn't happened yet. Hasn't been a problem yet. But, uh, you <laughs> no know, we, uh, it's actually, uh, you know, I really respect Superflux because they have uh, a, a real dedication towards the uh, experience for the consumer. Uh, we've, we've chatted about this, but part of the, uh, the 
kind of agreement for getting Superflux is that, you know, you have to store it cold. You can't request more than you think you're going to sell within a certain period. Like all of these different things to uh, make sure that the health of the beer is as, as great as it will ever be so that the consumer has an authentic as possible experience with the beer. Oh, yeah, we're completely sold out of these now. Like, well, one, <laughs> like the tasting kit, I could have probably sold twice as many tasting kits as I actually put together. I apologize to everyone. Like two weeks ago, like our tasting didn't sell out. It's really hard putting these together and saying, OK, we're going to sell about 24 tasting kits because we always sell about 24. And it comes down to the question of, OK, I don't think I can get another 24 of these. Do I put 124 of this beer that's going to sell out really quickly anyway, like the Superflux of the Strathcona? Do I put in something really cool with the idea that I want to show these off, but I can't make any more kits? Or do I play it safe and not put in something really cool like the Superflux? And then I kind of feel like I'm robbing the tasting series, but I also know that if we sell out on Monday afternoon, I can still keep making them till Wednesday. I try to balance it between the two. There are definitely weeks where it's like, nope, if we sell out, we can make as many more as we have to. Uh, and for like our one year anniversary, we brought in like five times as much stock as I thought we were going to need. We went through like way more than half of that. Um, but I just didn't want to sell out if it was humanly possible. But sometimes you got to just say, nope, we're doing super flux. If it sells out, it sells out. But screw it, we're doing super flux. We'll probably never be able right. to do it again. Anyway, <laughs> let us quickly do uh shameless promotion corner here uh we will talk about what we have coming up next while aaron quietly swears at his computer uh and this friday we have south africa revisited we are going to be digging into the south african wine industry once again um I just love South Africa so much. It's a topic I'm never going to get tired of. Uh, I'm certain that everyone watching is going to be so sick of South Africa, like years before I am. But I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, we're going to dig a little bit into uh, one of the things that I got in terms of feedback after the last South African tasting is I talked a lot about, oh, well, South Africa used to do this. South Africa used to do that. And we didn't taste anything like that. So we're going to taste the Beach House Citrus Grove Chenin Blanc, quite possibly the least expensive bottle of wine we've ever done. Uh, but it also happens to be a really good, like, $12 Chenin Blanc from South Africa. And it's really important because Chenin Blanc used to be the absolute linchpin to the entire South African industry. This is what South Africa was. Forget Pinotage, forget anything else. This is what they made. So we're going to talk about this in a historical context. Uh, the Craven Pinot Gris, uh, which is probably our best-selling orange wine in the store right now. Um, absolutely spectacular Pinot Gris. Um, would sell better if it didn't live in our like weird orange wine section that seemingly everyone including the people who work here have forgotten existed uh, but still sells really really well uh, and then a couple of really different uh, South African reds uh, Intel Intelligo or Intelego uh, these guys they're wonderful but just like uh, Superfox I can never get enough of them by any means uh, the Kandungu is not only the least expensive red it's also the only one that's usually always in stock uh, so this is kind of their entry level kind of fun blend. It's also delicious. Uh, Devin really thinks this should be like our best selling red in the store, or very close to. It's not, so we're gonna drink it. It's also just a fun hot weather red. Uh, and then the Smiley. Um, it's a little bit bigger. Um, this probably of everything on the table is gonna be the most familiar to most people. Uh, it's big at 13.5% alcohol. Uh, it's a big dry red, but it's not vintage, it's a version. So this is version four. Um, also, the label's terrifying, um, but it's, it's a blend of multiple years because they're going for a particular style and particular flavor. So if they have to use this year's crop and last year's crop and four years ago's crop to kind of blend together to make what they're going for, then they'll do that. So really interesting winemaking, cool orange wine, a little bit of history, and an absolutely delicious South African red. That is Friday night. Uh, tasting is $85. Uh, I'll be honest, we were initially just going to do uh, the last three for 80, but I thought that was kind of not great value and we were maybe making just a little too much money on it. So we threw in the beach house for an extra five bucks. So that way we can talk about the history and also that kills for like $12. So we're going to do that. Next week, we are getting into proper warm weather. Uh, one beer I want to revisit uh, and then three with some really fun, different flavors. Uh, this was originally just going to be like wild and crazy flavors, and then one of the beers I wanted to do was actually out of stock. Uh, so wild and crazy flavors, we have the Mint Gin Goza from Zero Issue. Uh, and we have the Green Tea and 
apricot, pardon me, I was going to say peach, but I knew it was wrong. Green tea, apricot, sour, uh, sour from Town Square Brewing. Uh, from Rebellion Brewing Company, we have their pineapple sour. Um, these guys apparently are like the best brewery in Saskatoon, so very interested to try that, actually. This is, a, oh, sorry, they're in Regina. Ew. Well, hopefully it's good. Vagina's not. Um, uh, and then finally, um, Jam Up the Mash by Collective Arts. This is a beer that, you know what, we did the Collective Arts tasting, and then we got to all the things, and the entire tasting went to hell, so we kind of forgot about it. Um, this rules. This is an absolutely delicious beer, uh, and I did want to talk about it a little bit more. So some different funky flavors, um, something from Regina, uh, and finally Jam Up the Mash. So that is beer tasting a week from tonight. Thank you for putting up with all of that, Grant. Um, I guess we should get on to the Happiness IPA. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not from Saskatchewan, but I can pretend to be, to be offended for our viewers if they are from Saskatchewan. <laughs> okay, but if they're from Saskatchewan, they'll know Saskatoon's the good city. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I guess last up here now, we're moving on to uh, Happiness. Yes, we are. Which is uh, uh, Mosaic... Uh, Mosaic West Coast IPA. Oh, wow. I have so many questions to get to here. Sorry, everyone. Give me a second here. Uh... Oh, yeah. McNally's at the zoo. McNally's was at the zoo for like a surprisingly long time. McNally's was still on tap in the zoo when I went to the U of L. God, extra old stock. Uh... Eric, I apologize. Uh, this has been a little bit since uh, you made the comment, so I'm not entirely sure what you're going for. Um, is anyone in Alberta dictating terms of distribution like that? Um, I, I imagine that can only be about Superflex. Okay. All right, Captain <clears throat> that, uh, Dictator, tell us how you're dictating distribution. <laughs> okay. We'll go over this. Uh, I go over this like 12 times a day with various people requesting Superflex. Uh, the way that it stands is that uh, we can only get a pretty limited amount of Superflex uh, to Alberta. Uh, effectively, uh, they can send uh, about a pallet of any product at a time. Uh, and so we reached out to a couple select uh, shops such as yourselves. Uh, and we just said, hey, here are the terms. Uh, here's how much we can probably work with for you. And so I think we have about uh, 20 distribution points right now as it stands for Superflex. Uh, throughout uh, throughout all of, all of Alberta, um, we are actively petitioning to get more Superflux into the market uh, on each shipment, so that we can expand the amount of uh, of uh, distribution points. But for now, it is uh, fairly tightly controlled. Is uh, Superflux distribution going to survive COVID? Are we still going to see this in Alberta post COVID? Excellent question. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep, we'll we'll leave that there. Um, they're pretty much always working on expanding their uh, production. Uh, so hopefully by the time the patios reopen in BC and this, that, the other, uh, that we will be able to see uh, an expanded production capacity for us. But uh, I don't have an answer to that as concretely as people might like. Fair enough. Yummy. Uh, yeah, Ataraxi is sold out online. Honestly, um, I'm going to shamelessly promote some stuff that we're not tasting tonight. Yes, there is some stuff that is completely sold out in Calgary that we did get some because we have a really amazing relationship with Establishment and Cabin and 88. So I do still have some Super Juicy by Cabin. I do still have some Pillow Talk by 88. I do still have some Ataraxia by Establishment. But um, we legitimately had a lineup at the door at 10 o'clock this morning when we opened for Super <laughs> Juicy. Um, I don't think... In fact, I know Super Juicy won't make it to the weekend. By Saturday morning, Super Juicy will be gone. I think the Pillow Talk will also be gone by Saturday morning. Uh, and if it's not, I'll be surprised. I got enough Ataraxia. I should still have it by next week, but I would be absolutely staggered if I still had it by next Wednesday. Um, so, yes, I have all three. Yes, they're still on the shelf right now. But, uh, yeah, they're not, they're not going to stick around long. Um, just like the last hour of the day, I got two Facebook messages, three phone calls, and a couple of walk-ins, like all either wanting to book, 
one or multiple of them uh, or just coming in and picking up like multiples. We're not enforcing purchase limits. I don't think I've had anybody come in and try and buy like a flat because I would have told them no. Um, but I think there's like a soft purchase limit of don't be a dick, don't buy more than three of each. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, they're, they're high alcohol IPAs and they're IPAs, don't buy nine of them. You know, you're, you're not gonna get through them before they start going stale. Uh, just gonna rip through the rest here. Uh, oh yeah, P Regina is home to pet friendly tap room bylaws and it's getting better. <laughs> and then crickets. <laughs> And Craig's set point is Regina circa 1984. Well, you know what? I will say, Craig, it is more like 1986 in Regina these days, so it has progressed. Set your watch back. Set your watch back only, you know, 35 years instead of whatever. You have to drive through the salt flats on the way there. Oh, you have to drive through the salt flats. On the way, yeah. So Regina seems like lots of wasteland by comparison. Well, there's like a three Beautiful. the waypoint, like a, you know, interesting land. When did this turn into just rip on Regina night, apparently? <laughs> I know it's entirely my fault, but I'm going to try to spin it so it's Aaron's fault. Um, right. Yeah, purchase that's limit that's is indeed don't be a room. dick. That is that is our purchase limit. Um, yeah, okay, so let's talk about the happiness IPA. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that uh, most everybody has uh, taken a sip by now, but um, uh, my first tasting note is just, damn. Yeah, that's a perfect tasting yeah. but I'm just going to have a, uh, a little more of that. A little little squidgy as far as things are concerned as a tasting note but uh you, you know you get it when you taste it that really is just yummy an absolutely perfect west coast ipa now i know that's a very 2021 answer because i remember at one point in my life thinking that Re central city red racer ipa was a perfect west coast ipa and now i can't drink it um it's the perfect West Coast IPA for right now. Um, I do know how That's West Coast... That's perhaps a balanced answer. Yeah. But... I've uh, I felt for a long time, not to cut you off here, but uh, I, felt, I felt for a long time that, uh, uh, you know, the hazy IPAs largely came out of this pendulum swing. You know, the, the West Coast IPAs became about packing the most bitterness into a beer as you could, and that was, it was the hops arms race. And um, so people, as a result of that, like, were just becoming alienated by it. And when realistically, like West Coast style IPAs are, are very balanced. They have just uh, a lot of balance going on in them inherently. Um, but uh, so then the, the, the hazy beer came as a result of that when people said, okay, less bitterness, more fruit, more accessible. And then the pendulum started swinging the other way pretty intensely, whereas now it's like, okay, let's pack a lot of like as much sweetness, as much dry hopping, as much of other stuff as we can. And now people are going, it's like, where is this Where is this perfect balance point? Where is this? So now we are seeing a little bit, I think, the pendulum swinging back the other way, where people taste things like this, which is kind of like just a nice West Coast-ish, but still a little bit juicy and just dry on the finish. And like, it's it's just not, anyway. It's, that, it's, that, that's my rant, thank you. For it's it's the, time. you know, it, I'd actually go and so far as to say this is like the the very specific part of north coast that's like petaluma santa rosa healdsburg california sort of west coast ipa the the lagunitas bear republic russian river style that very Ooh. pale beautifully balanced and okay i can say it because i've been to russian river honestly more times than i should really admit to because it's like <laughs> it's like seven and i don't live anywhere near there um, but I've been to Russian River seven times now, and it's um, it's always such a joy. I, I mean, not the food. The food's famously dreadful. But everything else is just an absolute joy. I've uh, never made the trek myself, but uh, uh, it, it's in the plans for whenever it's safe to travel again. I would say, you know, these days with where Alberta's at now, I don't know if I, I mean, I'm going to go back because it's me. Um, I don't know if I need to ever go back. I think now with the ability that we can just buy things like the Happiness IPA or name 10 breweries in Calgary or two in Edmonton or five in Vancouver, <laughs> we don't need to travel for beer anymore, at least, you know, short of going to like Belgium or Germany or something like that. Like I'd still like to go to like Didole uh, just because I love herb beer, um, which we've never had in Alberta, which is such a terrible tragedy. Um, mm -hmm. 
Well, that was a weird tangent. Um, but uh, no, I don't think we need to travel for like West Coast IPA. I don't think we need to travel for, you know, at least not kettle sours. And I'd argue with kind of what uh, some of the breweries are doing now. Um, I don't think we really need to travel for like barrel aged sours anymore. Unless you're like really, really into giant boozy bourbon barrel aged imperial stouts, you want to go to like Dark Lord Day because you hate your life. Um, you really don't need to travel for beer anymore. Like the things have changed so much. I can remember doing so much beer trading and everything back in the day. Now it's just why? Why go anywhere but here? Here's great. There, there's certainly a lot of great things coming out of uh, out of uh, uh, the Alberta scene. That uh, yeah, I, I, I've never been myself hugely into like the the whale hunting scene. On uh, as far as beer collecting goes, I've always just wanted to like get the beer and drink it. Uh, when I travel for beers, it's always more about uh, you know hanging out with friends and going to a new place and kind of experiencing the culture there more than it's about I need to get Dark Lord, I need to get whatever the Holy Mountain launch is, I need to get whatever else it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it certainly it certainly evolved scene that it was a couple of years ago in Alberta, where you can get, as you were mentioning, the barrel aged sours there from uh, like Trial and Ale and uh, and uh, the Monolith out of Edmonton. The establishments doing or the, them. The establishment and... sours, yeah, and the establishment is also trying to tackle those uh, big boozy Imperial IPAs now. So we're talking about that was the the series like the Duchess, whatever that new series is. I think they're planning on doing like more of those types of releases. Yeah, they. I, I heard that they were going to do well. I haven't heard they specifically are going to do Barrel Age Duchess, but I sure noticed a whole bunch of barrels show up about the same time as Duchess came out. Uh, so I assume there's some Duchess in some of those barrels, uh, but I haven't been specifically told. Mm. You can uh, you can probably put a fairly good bet on it. I, I've been chatting to uh, Mike Foniak off and on uh, from the establishment, and he was expressing that he de definitely wants to do some big barrel aged uh, sours. Or, sorry, big barrel aged imperial stouts is what I mean to say. Because you know what, however passe they might be, they're still really good. They're kind of like big, oaky <laughs> California Chardonnays. Are they cool anymore? God, no. Nobody proud of liking Kendall Jackson Shard. Do I still really like like Kendall Jackson or Rombauer or Steel Goodchild? Yeah, I really do. I still like that style, and I shamelessly like that style. And I kind of feel the same way about Imperial Stout. I don't buy them anymore so much, but you know, every now and then it's like, you know what? I feel like a beer in place of a chocolate cake and five shots of whiskey. I'll just buy this. Now, that being said, also, as you kind of mentioned, I think it's a little bit, uh, I don't want to say hugely passe, but I just don't think that as many people are brewing it the way that they used to. You know, I think that a lot of the, the specialty barrel aged launches have shifted uh, from the Imperial Stouts over into being more uh, uh, wild ferment saisons or other sours and things like that. I think that there's a bit of a higher degree of prestige. Uh, seen in making those styles of beer? I think that's fair. Um, there were the breweries that kind of did it before and still are doing it. Like I'm thinking of like 50-50 um, brewing out of like the Lake Tahoe area. Mm. They did it before. They're still doing it. I don't know if they have a sour program. I actually went to 50-50 a few years ago. Um, it's a really weird place. Like they're in this weird resort ghost town thing with like a whole bunch of like tacky fake mining stuff just laying everywhere it's kind of like being a heritage park in calgary but it's one step down from like weird mascots in disneyland suits like it's a <laughs> it's a weird town and then there's this amazing craft brewery there um but no i think the breweries that started out doing those big boozy barrel aged styles and did them well are still doing them but i think you're right i think the the mantle of what your prestige style should be has certainly shifted more into like barrel aged sours um a, because there's way more versatility in what you can do, uh, and B, just it's a more interesting style overall. There's just so much more flavor range. Now, that range depends on, on your house cultures. If you have shitty house cultures in your barrels, like that's just, it can get a little bit monotonous at times. So you really have to also train your, train your bacteria as much as you can uh, to be what you want them to be, or like eliminate barrels that just aren't working for you. Now that's something I don't actually know very much about. So do you want to expand on that a little bit? Like, I don't know about that at all. Well, so I, to a point until like rather recently, ultimately, I'm a little embarrassed to say, I was less educated on it than I could have been, but I was actually sitting down with uh, Mike Foniak from the establishment and he was talking a bit about his barrels and uh, uh, kind of training them to, uh, to be what he wanted them to be. And he was saying like, you know, we're finding they're just getting a, a little bit more acidic than we wanted them to be these days. So, you know, we're, 
we're, we're adding more hops into the beers so that we can kind of temper that back down and get it into a more reasonable range. And, and you know, that uh, if a beer just does, sorry, if a barrel just just goes, goes way too acidic for you, they just need to take it out of rotation and replace it with a new fresh barrel. Beautiful. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's got the, the short and sweet version on it. Uh, and the reason that it is a Cascade Desert, Jeremy, is the fact that, you know, we can't, aren't really allowed to do bars right now. Um, I think that we will see Cascale get back to being a thing again once bars are allowed to actually do cask nights and everything. So Cascale hasn't gone away. There are way too many people who bought really expensive Cascale like, equipment in Alberta uh, for it to ever go away completely because all of those folks are going to have to drag it out of storage after COVID to just get their money out of it. So Cascale will return. Um, it was already a bit Cascale of a... Cascale is another interesting one. It is. Well, yeah, it was, Cascale is like really easy to do uh, from, an, from a, a certain aspect because a lot of what that ends up being is that you just take a beer that you already have in the tanks, you put it into the cask with whatever adjuncts or other flavors you want to put into it, and then that's kind of just a cheap and dirty way to do like a, a special release at, uh, at an event at a bar if you want to. And sometimes it's really transparently just the cheapest, dirtiest version. It's like, well... <laughs> What are we doing tomorrow? Cascale event. What are we doing? Stout. Okay, it's going to be a chocolate stout. Somebody go buy, like, Baker's <laughs> chocolate. Um, I've seen that. It's, that's, that's really not that common, happily. But I've certainly seen that sort of thing where it's like, oh, crap, we committed to a cask event. We need to do... Uh, somebody go buy raspberries. <laughs> We're just going to do a raspberry version. Uh, Tofino, uh, I, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but they used to do a, uh, uh, a weekly cask at their, uh, just at the brewery. And I think the most interesting casket that I ever saw, now, clearly there are tons that I didn't see, but uh, they took just Tofino Blondale and they added strawberries and basil. Hmm. And just to add that, you know, like herbaceous savory note to it. And I think that that might be one of the most culinary uses of a cask that I've ever seen. I like strawberry and basil together just in general terms. In a beer, it could be absolutely perfect. Delightful. Mm-hmm. Or I guess the other side of that would be uh, kind of to, to tie into, oh, yeah, let's just add cocoa into the Imperial Stout would be, uh, let's just add, add add as many chili peppers into the beer as we can was always the uh, kind of other counterpoint to that. See, now I do like hot pepper stouts. I, I really do. Um, chili pepper ale Smith Speedway is still great. But, yeah, I'm, I'm going to like that anyway. And you don't have to make it what everyone is doing. I think one of the worst beers I ever had was the barrel aged vanilla hot pepper stone smoked porter and it was just <laughs> the worst thing i think it happily came like a little 175 ml that i think it paid like 12.95 for because that was what stone was charging for their seasonals in the u.s at the time oh, i also think it was like 12.95 u.s at the time when the canadian dollar wasn't great uh so i probably about like 17 dollars um and it was just wretched i couldn't drink it it was absolutely appalling and I think that might have been the um, the jump the shark for that whole movement where everyone was doing these giant 13, 14% horribly under attenuated, just bad Imperial Stouts, just straight up bad Imperial Stouts. I, I think that uh, part of the reason there was that people realized that people aren't buying more than one of these anyway. Like we don't need people to like buy a four pack and then drink the whole four pack. We're going to do this as a once-off, and so we're going to make it just as filthy of a beer as we can with as many buzzwords on it as possible. And so then you could just make it horrifically sweet, and you're only going to drink this much and share it with friends anyway. So why do we need to care about balance? Yeah, there was very definitely the bottle share character for all of those. You make something rare enough, no one's going to buy it for themselves. They're going to take it to the bottle share and then Instagram it, and then it's going to be seen by lots of people which is also something I really hate about the wine industry right now, is everything is an Instagram goddamn bottle share. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm starting to get in my angry place about things, so maybe we'll call it a night there. Just just have more Easy Tiger. Yeah, well, I, I have just, just more enough Easy love. Tiger. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. Have a wonderful night. Thanks for having me. Take care. Good night. Cheers. And that was Grant Flagg from Copper in Theory. And uh, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton. That's been Aaron. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our monstrously off-topic exploration of Strathcona versus Superflux. We never really come to a consensus of which was better. I mean, Superflux, but I would not judge anyone for saying the Strathcona side. 
I mean, I, I judge Craig, but anyone else. Uh, so that's it. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a wonderful evening.